So Christmas is not commanded by Scripture. You can't find any place in there that God says celebrate Christmas or celebrate my birth. And yet he dedicates chapters, whole chapters in the Scripture to talking about his birth. Again, because it's central to Christianity. So I believe that we should celebrate. We, we can celebrate. If you don't care to celebrate, that's fine. But the birth and the death of Jesus are two things that we as Christians need to commemorate and not let ourselves just be overtaken by the commercialism of the day. Amen? So a lot of people say, well, because Christ Christmas actually has pagan roots. So let me just address that. Okay? True and false. Okay, at 98 AD, they started celebrating Epiphany. Epiphany means revelation. It means the fact that Jesus appeared on the earth. And from that time forward, that's what they celebrated. They celebrated January the 6th as Epiphany um, on the Roman calendar. Um, and in the year, let me see if I can find this year. Is it up there? Yep, uh, AD 336. The Emperor Constantine, who was a converted pagan, decided that they would replace all these pagan celebrations that were going on. What were the pagan celebrations in the Roman Empire? Well, they, they celebrated and they worshipped um, Mithras, who was the Persian god of light, and Saturn, who was the, the, the god of agriculture. They, they celebrated something called Saturnalia, and they worshipped a, a guy named Mithras. Now, how many here have heard of the worship of Saturnalia? Like three people, probably because you've heard me preach before. No. How many have heard of Mithras? So you know what he did? He came in, and on the very day that those pagan gods were worshipped, Constantine decided, you know what? We are going to supplant, we're going to overthrow pagan worship and we're going to build a stronghold for Christ on top of the place that the enemy has had his stronghold. You understand that's an Old Testament principle. They didn't just go in and tear down all the cities. They went and they conquered the cities, and then they built a stronghold for God where the enemy had once held a stronghold. And so guess what? Constantine had this idea, we're going to overthrow pagan worship, we're going to replace it with worship for Christ. Now there was a danger because of something called syncretism, which meant that they blended false God worship with true God worship. And that did happen and has happened throughout the earth. But let me just ask you something. <laughs> Most of you have never heard of Saturnalia. Most of you have never heard of Mithras. I think his supplanting of those things worked. 92% of American households say they celebrate Christmas. They may not even know the true meaning of Christmas, but they understand, to a certain degree, the baby in the manger. We go to Asia. Asia's wild about Christmas. Crazy about it. You think we decorate? You ought to see Asia decorate. We go every January, and they're still in the middle of their decorations. You know what? They may not fully understand that this is a Christian holiday because Buddhists celebrate it. Hindus celebrate it. They, I mean, they, they're crazy about it. They love it. Isn't that wild? I love it. Because it makes them ask questions. Why are we celebrating? Who are we celebrating? <laughs> so I think that Constantine overthrew Christmas. But that's where people say, oh, you know, it's got pagan roots. Mm, the day, maybe. But what they did is they overthrew false worship. Amen? So let me read this to you. Uh, this was written by one of the historians in that period of time. It says, long before Constantine, Christians found a way to redeem local cultures and salvage elements in those cultures that naturally pointed to Christ, whether Hebrew, Syrian, Greek, or Roman. They denounced inhumane pagan practices, but at the same time took over pagan temples and converted them into churches. Come on, this has happened all over the world. You go in and they say, oh, it was once this, it was once that, but it became a Christian church. They replaced the old gods in popular devotion with he heroic martyrs of the persecutions, and they replaced the holy days of paganism with festivals for the Christian year. So, you know, if you have a hard time really celebrating Christmas because of that, let me just remind you that your seven days of the week are all named after Roman gods. Sunday is the worship of the sun. Monday is the worship of the moon. Tuesday is the worship of two, a god. 
Wednesday was something. Thursday was Thor's day. So if you're going to make this really strict line, most of your months are named after false gods. Can we redeem it instead of rejecting it? <laughs> and not be ridiculous. As a matter of fact, when you actually look at some of the symbols that we use in Christianity, you'll find that many of these symbols started out as pagan forms of worship. For example, how many of you, or is there anybody here that has a cross on? Anybody have a cross on? Okay, several people have, are wearing crosses. Okay, so the cross to us is a holy sacred symbol because it is the, the, the implementation that God used to redeem mankind when Jesus was nailed to the cross. But you know what? In the Roman culture, it was a symbol of death. To us, it's a symbol of life. To them, it was a symbol of death. It was a symbol of execution. It's like wearing an electric chair around your neck. But rather than reject it, we redeemed it. Are you getting the, are you getting the understanding? How about the fish, the Christian fish? How many have ever seen the little ichthys Christian fish? We were in Ephesus and walking through the streets of Ephesus that's been excavated, and you could actually find carved into the roads of Ephesus, you could actually find a fish. And this was how Christians communicated during that time to say, if you found a fish outside of this, this home, you knew that Christian worship happened in this home. But do you know that the fish was also a pagan symbol of worship of Dagon? and a pagan symbol in Rome of the worship of Pisces. And so rather than reject it, they just redeemed it. We have to understand our job is to redeem culture. So the Christmas tree. Martin Luther was actually the first one that gave us the Christmas tree. He was the one that had people bring trees into their homes and decorate them with the fruit and put actually the first one to put lights on it. But the pagans used it too. Um, they would cut down evergreens and bring them into their homes, and they used it um, as a symbol of, uh, because the evergreen stayed green through the harshest of winters and the months of darkness, it was a symbol for promise to survive the hard times, okay? That's how the pagans used it, and yes, the pagans did use it, but Martin Luther looked at it, and he actually did this. He was the one that believed that the Christmas tree was a symbol of the promise of Christ who would turn briars into thorns to a fir tree. Bri briars and thorns into a fir, fir tree. It was a symbol of eternal life and the everlasting love of God. Just as the color didn't fade, so God's love would never fade, no matter the circumstances or the trial. It reminds us that Christ was crucified on a tree. He decorated a tree with fruit representing the tree of life, he was also the first to put candles on the tree, and he used this scripture, Revelations 22, 2. In the midst of the streets of it, and on either side of the river, was the tree of life, which bare 12 manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the trees were for the healing of the nations. So Martin Luther, the reformer, actually gave us the Christmas tree. 